evening, everyone, and welcome again to another Town Hall Tuesday here on the Fox 13 Facebook page. Bob Evans and Kelly Chapman and Dr. Angela Dunn coming to you live this evening. Dr. Dunn is the Utah State epidemiologist and is an expert and has just really carried a lot of water when it comes to the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic here in Utah the preeminent expert on all of this. Uh, Dr. Dunn, thank you so much for being with us on this Town Hall Tuesday. It's so nice to meet you virtually, Dr. Dunn. I feel like, <laughs> to your credit and expertise, you're a household name and face. Before we jump into the questions, I just want to get a little background. Uh, are you from Utah originally, and where did you go to school? Yeah, so no, I moved to Utah five years ago for a job. I was a fellow with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and stationed out here. Had never set foot in Utah, but it grows on you pretty quickly. So we're here to stay now. Um, spent a lot of my childhood in Texas and Chicago. So kind of from wherever, we're all over. That's well, awesome. we want, we're want we so glad you're here because I know our Facebook friends have tons and tons and tons of questions to ask you, especially in light of the recent spike in the numbers and especially in light of the reopening of the economy to a degree and, and moving forward in that way. And so we would invite uh, our Facebook friends to uh, write your questions in the uh, comments area below and uh, address them to Dr. Dunn and she will answer them uh, as best uh, she can and, and Kelly and I will just try to keep up. But uh, in, in the meantime, while we're waiting for some of these first questions to come in, Dr. Dunn, um, with the reducing of the COVID-19 threat level from orange to yellow, it appears that many Utahns believe the pandemic is over. How can you impress upon them the fact that it isn't over? Yeah, so I think that's a great clarification, a great way to start this conversation. Um, the colors of red, orange, yellow, and green are all related to the number of restrictions we're putting on our economy. So as we decrease in color, we're decreasing restrictions. But what's interesting about that is as we're doing that, we're actually increasing the risk of spread of COVID-19. And we're constantly playing this balance between, you know, opening up the economy and protecting people's health. It. So we think we're striking that right balance, but it's really important for people to know that as we loosen restrictions, there is going to be an increased risk of spread. And we're going to be relying more and more on individuals to social distance, wear face coverings, stay home when you're ill, and, and of course, wash your hands. Um, as much as possible. Yeah, but a lot of the people I see out there at the store are doing anything but that. How, how do we get them back in the boat? You know, it's really important for every Utah to recognize that the risk of COVID is, is high right now. And if we want to maintain a strong economy, it's going to be up to all of us to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And that will also help us prevent unnecessarily illness and death among Utahns. So every action we take as individuals is helping our community. Um, it's hard for us to really impress upon people something that they haven't experienced personally, but we know that you know now we're up to over 12,500 cases or yeah. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do here in Utah. Kelly, have you got some questions? Sorry, yeah, I was just kind of monitoring and getting on, on Facebook here. Dr. Dunn, it's kind of interesting. I have three children myself, and I feel like I'm seeing a couple different extremes. One, families and kids who are caring about their day as normal, and then other families who are completely quarantining themselves from the virus. We are seeing businesses start to reopen up, some sort of normalcy trying to return. And I'm faced right now as a mom. Do I sign my child up? for football camps and basketball camps and my daughter wants to do cheerleading and you know what's your recommendation how do we as parents make that delineation on what's safe for our family and what is good to get back to normal i don't i just see such extremes here absolutely i mean it's all about the level of risk that you and your family are willing to take knowing that there are still covid cases out there and there is still a likelihood of spread so how can we help protect our loved ones against COVID-19. And there's definitely a balance to be had between doing the things you love and also, you know, 
trying to eliminate your exposure to others to decrease COVID spread. And so I get asked this question tons by friends. And, and I always tell them that, you know, this is what's going on. We have an increase in cases. It's mostly in our urban centers. And here are the high risk groups for severe disease. And so if we equip everybody with the right facts and knowledge, they can make the best decision for themselves and their families. Uh, Dr. Dunn, let's get to the questions that are coming in from our Facebook friends. Shalene Ray wants to know, why are protests okay, but not church or graduations? Yeah, so, I mean, the protests are definitely concerning, um, seeing it on the news and, and seeing a lot of people congregating in close settings together. Um, so the next week or so, we'll definitely tell if, if we do have COVID-19 spread due to those protests. Um, we are recommending that local communities assess their own risk of COVID-19 spread in their community and determining whether or not church and other religious worships can, can happen, um, given the risk of COVID spread when you're inside in a, a very crowded setting. That's how outbreaks happen. Um, so protest is something we're gonna keep our eye on. Um, but yeah, again, it's up to those local districts to determine what the risk is there, depending on the spread. You know, with those protests and other events in which we've seen some mass gatherings, Dr. Dunn, again, it's a mixed bag on who's wearing face coverings and who's not. Have we seen any sort of results, negative results? When I say negative results, I mean in the sense of a spread of COVID-19 or a, a spike. What do you foresee happening? Yeah, so we haven't yet seen any spikes um, specifically due to the protests. It typically takes about a week for um, from someone being exposed to showing symptoms. So, you know, this weekend and early next week, we'll definitely be telling. Um, we do know that, you know, right after Memorial Day and after going a few weeks after going to yellow and loosening up restrictions, we started seeing an increase in cases. So we do know that the more people get out and about and are in contact with each other, the more cases we're going to see. So what our goal is to really protect those individuals at high risk for severe disease from ever getting infected um, so that we can protect those who are most at risk. Uh, Dr. Dunn, um, Marin Freulich Rose has a question. Are pools safe to be in and can COVID-19 pass through chlorine? Yeah, so that's a great question that everyone's asking, especially as the temperatures get hotter. Um, of course, there's not a lot of evidence or traditional studies we have out there about COVID in chlorine because, again, it's a new virus. We just identified it in November. Um, but based on kind of what uh, the way other similar viruses spread, um, chlorine can be a good disinfectant. And so um, when we're making recommendations for pools opening in the public setting, we definitely take that into consideration and are concerned, of course, about the crowding and people being close together versus COVID being in a pool and, and spreading that way. So today on Live at Four, you'll appreciate the story, Dr. Dunn. There was a group of epidemiologists who were asked in a survey, when will you go to a movie theater? When will you go out to eat? When will you shake hands? When will you start hugging people again? When will you stop wearing a mask? And some of those results were surprising. Uh, these okay. doctors are saying it will be a year before they stop wearing a mask or will shake hands with somebody. Uh, What's your, you know, I don't want to put you too much on the, the spot here, but what do you think about that? And people within the professional community, sure. community that may see things differently than we do in the general public. What do you think? Yeah, it's definitely the danger of knowing a bit too much. Um, so me personally, I'm definitely in that camp. I see the threat of COVID-19 in our communities. You know, I live in Salt Lake City, which is an urban area that has a higher risk of spread. So I'm certainly making sure that I'm wearing a face covering when I'm out in public. I'm limiting my um, exposure to public spaces, you know, staying outside on non-crowded trails and um, staying at home and playing with my kids at home is, is what we're doing. We're not really going out into public spaces. Um, whenever we need to go grocery shopping, either me or my husband go, we don't take a family trip or anything like that anymore. So we're definitely adhering to precautions. Um, and I, I think that's the right thing to do moving forward for most families is, to really figure out that balance between your sanity and also protecting your family's health. Um, Dr. Dunn, 
Should those who are at higher risk of suffering more severe symptoms after contracting COVID-19, and I'm talking about diabetics and obese, hypertensive, kidney disease, heart disease, folks with underlying health issues, should they still be self-isolating or quarantining themselves? Or in other words, living at a red threat level? Yeah, I mean, these are individuals who are at high risk for severe disease, you know, hospitalization, um, and even mortality. And so we are really encouraging these populations to take extra precautions and be very aware of who they're around and limit their exposures to people that are outside of their household. This is how we're gonna prevent excess death and illness in Utah um, is by helping out these populations. And so, you know, if you have a neighbor or a friend who falls within one of these categories, offer to go grocery shopping for them. You know, give them a call, give them socialization virtually, and that can really help everybody tolerate, you know, these recommendations longer and keep us safer. Okay, Dr. Dodd, on the flip side of that, I think it was from the very beginning, um, the findings were that children, young children, weren't really getting coronavirus. Has that been the case? Has that maintained? Or what sort of caseload are you seeing, at least within our state, of children? So I'm anybody under the age of 18 contracting COVID-19? I mean, we have very few cases less than 18 um, that we don't even, you know, break that down by geography because it's too small. Um, so we are seeing kind of the same trends as we see nationally and across the world is that it's typically the highest infection rate, you know, is that 25 to 45 year old range. And then the severe disease is 65 and older. Um, you know, but we have to remember that we also close schools down very early. So there might be that element of decreased opportunity for spread, which is why we're being so cautious and thoughtful in planning for school reopening um, to make sure that that spread doesn't happen with kids. Well, speaking of school, let's talk about that for just a moment. Considering the fact that uh, we have seen a spike in the numbers again, um, is it a good idea if we continue on this trend to go back to school in the fall? Yeah, we're working with experts. I mean, we know that um, there are impacts of not going to school that are far beyond, you know, protecting from COVID. Um, and so weighing the risks and the benefits is really essential here. And what we're doing is working with the Board of Education to figure out how we can safely reopen schools and using this time we have in the summer to plan and make sure that we have all of the elements in place to make sure our teachers, the staff, and the, and the students stay safe. Is that a possibility that perhaps the schools would not reopen or reopen as we know it? Because what we're 10 weeks away from schools supposedly reopening. Yeah, and I, I can tell you that every school is planning for kind of A, B, C, D contingencies. Um, we, as this outbreak has shown, we can't predict it exactly. So we need to have those contingency plans based on what it does. And the safety and health of the students is, of course, our utmost priority. So having all those contingency plans will make sure that we're prepared for whatever lies ahead of us in the fall. Let me ask you this, Dr. Dunn. Would there be a scenario where parents can choose? So if you feel comfortable for your family dynamic to allow your children to go to school and be with others, then that's an opportunity you'll be able to do. Whereas different families, if they don't feel comfortable or there's some sort of health condition, they would be able to then just choose the online route. So you kind of give people options. I mean, that's a, that's a great idea. And working through that, you know, making sure we have the infrastructure in place to accommodate that is going to be key without um, stretching our teachers so thin, you know, they're already stretched thin already having to teach two different style classes. We want to make sure that we have that option and infrastructure in place. Um, so that is on the consideration table, but again, we're just in the planning stages now with board of education, um, and the local schools and local health districts to determine what's feasible and, and what's actually going to be most beneficial. To them. It's a big undertaking, especially when they kind of had to slam together online school. Yeah. Nobody would have ever imagined I know. In the school year. Yep. Um, Dr. Dunn, uh, we've got a number of different questions uh, in relationship to asymptomatic uh, transmission. And, uh, and, and let, let me just put it this way. Yesterday, the World Health Organization said that 
uh, the actual transmission from asymptomatic people is very rare, is what they said. But then today, they came back and walked that back and said that, well, actually, we don't really know how often uh, asymptomatic people transmit the uh, virus to other people. What is the truth about asymptomatic transmission? Sure. I mean, of course, we know that asymptomatic transmission is possible, that somebody can have no symptoms and potentially infect someone else. Um, the thing is how often and in what situations, and this is one of those things that time will tell as we get more information. The first piece of that is going to be able to identify an asymptomatic case, and those people aren't you know, readily coming forward to be tested or calling their doctor, right? Um, so that's why we're really encouraging all Utahns to take precautions and presume that asymptomatic spread can happen because we know what's happened in our state. You know, some of our long-term care facility outbreaks started with an asymptomatic staff worker. And so we know it's possible. And if we want to do everything we can to limit the spread here, you know, face coverings are going to be important as, as well as social distancing. I'm just seeing a couple people echoing the same question. Angie Sanchez says, once you have had COVID, can you get it again? That's been a big question tossed around. Do we even know? God, there is some evidence of reinfection, unfortunately. Um, we just don't know how long immunity lasts after somebody's been infected. So we're continuing to presume that everyone is susceptible to COVID, even if they've been infected. What about these antibody testings? Dr. Don, I mean, with that information, is it even worth it? Why are we trying to push yeah. antibody tests? So antibody testing is really useful on the population level. It allows us in a, in a big number of people to understand um, the spread of COVID-19 beyond what maybe we missed, right? When somebody was symptomatic. It's tricky on the individual level. Um, if you haven't been exposed or you weren't positive for COVID in the past, these antibody tests are actually 50% right and 50% wrong. So it's a coin toss when you actually get it done. There are ways to improve that. Um, and I know, for example, our own lab, ARUP, is working on making that improvement. But right now, it, it is pretty much a coin toss. So if somebody's out there thinking about getting an antibody test for their own individual health reasons, it's important to realize that, one, we don't know if it's the right result. And two, it doesn't mean you're immune. Um, and so it really doesn't play a lot of impact on somebody's individual health right now. Haley Dale has a question. When can we have visitors in the hospital, at least one person to be able to visit? Yeah, and you know, um, this is, we have a working group with all of our healthcare systems and we talk about these rules regularly. And it's really important to not spread COVID to the vulnerable populations in the hospital. I mean, that would just be tragic. So. We're going to be extra cautious and conservative in those visitor policies. But, you know, of course, understanding that family visitation um, is really important. Um, so I can't predict when, um, but know that it's something we are constantly talking about and, and trying to safely allow visitors in those settings. Michael Smith has a question. What about those over 65 who do not have any underlying health conditions? Do they need to self-isolate? Right. So even when we separate the data from those with underlying health conditions who are over 65 and those without underlying conditions who are over 65, just the fact of being over 65 is its own risk factor, unfortunately. Um, so we recommend that if you're over 65, you take all the precautions necessary to limit your exposure to those who might have COVID. The color wheel that you guys are using on risk level, I, I think that's really a good way to express what's happening right now. We were high, then we went to orange most of the state, and now the majority of Utah is in the yellow zone. Danielle Turpin is saying, when do we go to green? Green would be the normal or extreme low risk phase. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, so green is where there's you know very limited restrictions on economic activity. Um, but again, to, to the first point, that doesn't mean that the risk of COVID spread is low. It just means that there's no restrictions being placed on economic activity. Um, in terms of when we're going to go green, you know, that's really hard to predict right now. We're seeing a surge in cases. Um, so I know the governor isn't thinking about it right now, 
um, we definitely want to make sure that we're going to continue to have hospital capacity to care for everybody with and without COVID before we make any of those decisions. Yeah, talk to that for just a second. What is the relationship between the COVID-19 risk levels and hospital capacity? Sure. So um, right now, the governor's leadership team is looking at hospitalization and hospital capacity um, in order to determine, you know, what the response is going to look like moving forward. We want to make sure that we don't overwhelm our hospitals and that everybody who needs care for COVID or not COVID can get there. Um, so we have um, a um, account of all the available beds, both ICU beds and non-ICU beds throughout the state. And every day we get a report from the hospitals about how many of those are filled. So we know that within about a week of somebody testing positive for COVID, those who are going to be hospitalized will be hospitalized within about a week. And about 8% of everybody who tests positive for COVID in Utah becomes hospitalized. So we can project kind of what our hospital beds will look like moving forward as we see this increase in cases. Um, so it's really important to us to, you know, start turning that curve down so that we have more hospital capacity. Bob and I have had this conversation, and I've had it with family members and other friends. Dr. Dunn, you probably have as well. How lucky are we to be in the state of Utah? Because it's a very different dynamic and makeup than comparing it to New York City, some of these other hot spots. What do you attribute us? Is it, you know, larger living areas, younger population? cleaner way of living? What is it exactly? Why aren't we being hit as hard as some other areas in the country? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the first point is that we're probably about a month behind those areas in terms of disease spread. Our first case was much later than everybody. Um, so we are, at unfortunately, still at the beginning of this outbreak in Utah. However, you're right, our younger population, um, you know, are more rural and frontier and spacious um, geography, those contribute to decreased severity of COVID-19 in Utah. But we just need to stay the course longer um, because we were kind of living through it when it was happening in the Northeast um, and it's hitting us a little bit later. So we just want to really encourage everyone to hang on out there and adhere to social distancing and face coverings, um, even though people I know are getting fatigued, but, but we are really at the beginning of this still here in Utah. If you're just joining us, this is uh, Town Hall Tuesday on the Fox 13 Facebook page. Our guest is Utah epidemiologist Dr. Angela Dunn. She's taking our questions and your questions as well. In fact, Tina Sailing Waters, Walters, I should say, wants to know, what about sports? I know some are going back to indoor contact sports like basketball. What risk level is something like this? So, you know, when, when we're talking about sports, we really want to make sure that everybody is being screened so that, you know, similar to, you know, childcare settings, you don't want a sick player coming to practice. Um, the other important thing is, of course, cleaning, making sure everybody's using good hygiene on the sports equipment um, and making sure nobody has symptoms at that practice. And that will lower the risk of COVID-19 spread in these settings. But again, this Everything we do right now is going to have some level of risk. Nothing is risk-free in the pandemic right now. So we need to be aware of that um, and, and take the necessary precautions. And let me follow up just quickly. If, uh, if it's possible for you to be asymptomatic for two to three days before uh, the symptoms present, you, could you be spreading the disease and not even know it? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's why it's so important that we have contact tracing here at the public health level, because that the most common way people are getting infected by COVID-19 here in Utah is by knowing someone who has COVID-19 and being exposed to them. So we do everything we can to reach out to every close contact and let them know and have them stay home for 14 days. And that's going to limit that asymptomatic spread that you were talking about. I hate to backtrack for a moment, Dr. Dunn, but I want to hit back on um, a couple questions back. You said that Utah State, we have not seen the biggest spike. We're just kind of entering it, that we're behind other states by about a month. And that makes me really nervous knowing what we've been through, the way our schools and businesses have shut down, that that could come back and happen again and perhaps even more so, more impactful. I mean, that that is a possibility, right? 
I mean, it's a possibility, but it's not on the table right now, right? I think we can do this without having to revert back to red. Um, that's where it really comes down to coming together as a community and really taking that effort to maintain social distancing as much as possible, wear face coverings and stay home when we're even mildly ill. I mean, we have a culture, right, that we just, you know, stick it out and go to work if we have that slight cough. Well, now's not the time to do that. We we really need to protect our community and and take these measures seriously so that we can continue to have economic uh, you know um, activity while protecting the health too. Sharon Putnam Summers has a question. Utah is spiking. What are the metrics to move to orange or red? Yeah, so the governor's office is definitely looking at those hospitalization metrics. Um, the primary goal there is to not overwhelm our healthcare systems. And right now we are lucky in Utah to have very strong healthcare systems that have capacity. Um, but we work with them daily to understand that capacity and the impact of our increasing COVID cases. You know, if we get to that point where it looks like our healthcare systems are gonna be overwhelmed, that's when you know those tough conversations will, will start happening. I think the virus, like so many things, is that if you aren't directly dealing with it or your family's not directly dealing yeah. with it, you kind of put it on the back burner, right? Yeah. But it was back in March when Rudy Gobert, all of a sudden it was announced that he had COVID-19. I think then it woke up our community, Dr. Dunn, wouldn't you agree? And then knowing that Donovan Mitchell too. And I know you were there because you met the team when they came back to Utah, right? What was that like for you kind of stepping in like, okay, we're opening the floodgates to celebrities have it here in Utah? Kind I mean, of it, it just... Of course it would happen in Utah to a Utah jazz player. It just seems like we always get those kind of like one-offs that throw us in the limelight for a little bit. Um, so there, you know, from a public health standpoint, there wasn't a lot of, you know, there was no risk to the general public of Utah. So we were really in a communication and media challenge at that point. Um, and, you know, we did great. I mean, as a state in terms of handling that, um, the, the players in the jazz organization was incredibly responsible and receptive to all of the advice. And they wanted to make sure they were, you know, a good behavior model for what quarantine looks like. Um, and everyone took it really seriously. So I, I think, you know, we can use that kind of as our, um, you know, badge moving forward is, you know, be like the Utah jazz. They stuck it out for 14 days when there was no spread in Utah at that point. Um, and, and we can do that too. Now that we've got, you know, again, over 12,000 cases, it's, it's more risky now than ever. And we really just need to make sure we're taking that seriously across the state. So true. I think really not only the state, but the country, when you had two major NBA players sure. all of a sudden had it, it became more real in a way. Yeah. But and then when the NBA, right, they shut down their season too shortly yeah. thereafter. And that's how, you know, it just really interrupted our lifestyles. Right. Right. Like we need to take this serious. Yeah. yeah. Yesterday, Dr. Dunn, um, New Zealand declared itself COVID-19 free, but I'm wondering how did they do that? And can we do that here in the United States and even here in Utah? Well, they did it by very strict and restrictive policies. Um, New Zealand's an island, so they have that going for them. They didn't allow anybody coming in. And they also closed down all non-essential businesses when they had very few cases and they kept them closed until very recently. So they adopted a kind of um, hit early, hit hard approach, um, and that worked for them, which is fantastic. But they're even though they're COVID free, they're still not opening up their airports to outsiders. Um, so they were able to pull through, but they've got a lot of things going for them um, that are a little different here in Utah. They made a lot of sacrifices to get to that level, it sounds like. They felt yep. like it was worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, they were able to do that successfully, which is which is a great model. And I think Australia is following something similar as well. Um, but again, I think we're in terms of the U.S. and Utah, um, we've definitely taken a different approach and we have we have different circumstances here. Right. So um, there's not going to be a one approach at all for this. pandemic. Ed O'Neill uh, has more of a comment than a question. He says, I contracted the coronavirus. And I can assure people it's not just another flu. I was in such pain. It hurts so bad. I was quarantined for a month and just barely got my release earlier this week. 
Can you yeah, comment on that? Compare absolutely. I mean, Ed hit it, the nail on the head with that. People are really focused on that hospitalization and mortality, but those who don't need to be hospitalized are really down for several weeks. I mean, healthy individuals, their lungs are damaged for several weeks and, and a lot of people can't get to their normal physical activity level for months. Um, so there is kind of that medium term impact, even if you don't have to be hospitalized. Um, so yeah, I, I'm sorry he had to go through that, but I'm glad he pulled through. Are the typical symptoms, Dr. Dunn, still fever, dry cough, body ache, shortness of breath? Yeah, so those were the cardinal symptoms at the beginning of this. Um, the CDC recently greatly expanded those symptoms. As we learn more about this disease, it does seem like there's more kind of systemic symptoms, you know, diarrhea, vomiting, just general fatigue, headache, very generalized symptoms can all indicate COVID-19. Um, so I encourage anybody who feels like they may have been exposed to COVID-19 or have a symptom that's not easily explained by something else to call their provider and get tested. Uh, we are uh, coming to, I mean, we've got the questions continuing to come and flow and flow and flow, but I know your time is limited, Dr. Dunn, and I know uh, we need to be respectful of that. Let me just uh, say Tommy Hooper, uh, has a question, uh, says co-worker took COVID test around noon last Friday. He still doesn't have his result. Mm -hmm. What gives? Thought it was a 48-hour turnaround. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, it's hard to comment on a one-off, but I can say in general, um, with the reopening of the economy and our hospitals, there are a lot of demand or there is a lot of demand for testing right now. Um, most of our laboratories can still result in 48 hours. So it's something that I would hurt, encourage him to follow up with the testing site specifically. Um, but we are working to make sure that our capacity maintains a level where we can get a result within 24 to 48 hours, because that's what's going to make a difference. Another comment from Robert Moody said, hit six of us in my family. Take this serious, people. Lost my mom. <sighs> How often are you seeing when one individual in a family gets it, everyone else does, versus a Ben McAdams where he's the only one in his family who got it? I know that's what's so fascinating about this. It's hard to predict. Um, we do know that about 30 to 50% of um, people in a household who have one infected individual will get infected. So it's not 100%, but you know, about half of your family members or half of the household members will get infected if the virus is circulating. Um, so that's where right now most of our cases are coming from. And that'll probably change as people start going to work and socializing a little more. But household transmission is, is real. And that's why it's, it's so important for people to understand those symptoms. And if they live with someone who's at higher risk, to, to be able to isolate from them if they are sick. We need a vaccine. we got to yeah. get this vaccine. I mean, I've been hearing all these different stories by the end of the summer, by the end of the year. So set us straight, Dr. Dunn, what's going in with vaccine development? I mean, I, I wish I had more detail than you do. Um, unfortunately, I don't. We're, we're definitely in phase two trials of a vaccine, and, and that is a good thing. That's a step in the right direction. Um, it is really important to get through all of these trials in a very thoughtful way so that we get a vaccine that works. And it doesn't cause more harm than good. And that that does take time. Um, I know they're pushing the time limits on this. Latest I heard is kind of end of fall. It would be fantastic if we had one in a couple months. But um, I think that's, that's hoping. And I don't know how realistic that is. Uh, Dr. Dunn, let's talk statistics real quickly, uh, if we can. There are roughly 3 million people in Utah. We have, uh, we've tested, what, 200,000 people now, is that correct? Yeah, over 200,000, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So about 10%. Mm -hmm. And so about 200,000 people. Of those 200,000, 12,000 some odd have tested positive. And then, so we're already seeing a shrinking uh, portion of the population that are being affected by this. And then beyond that, we're seeing an even smaller number of people actually being hospitalized and an even smaller number of that actually passing away. And yet, 
we are so concerned about this virus that we have shut down schools, we've shut down non-essential businesses. Yes, we're coming back and, and all of that, but uh, talk to me about the relationship between the hard numbers of what we're experiencing and the um, virility of this virus and its effect on our society. Yeah, so I think because we took all of those early um, actions in terms of school closures and large gathering limitations, we're lucky that we've had such low case numbers relative to our population and low hospitalizations and low mortality. Um, we need to be extra cautious as we open back up that we don't take this too lightly because that's exactly what could cause us to you know, become a New York or, or an Italy and we don't want that. Um, and so it's gonna take all of us to really continuously think about COVID-19 over the next several months and make sure that we're doing our part to, to limit the spread in case we are ill. Um, but I, I know that's hard, but it, it is just that unknown of the pandemic and we don't have a vaccine and we don't have treatment. So we don't have a way of controlling it other than you know social distancing, mask wearing, hand hygiene. Okay, so this is where it gets me, Dr. Dunn. Again, Bob and I, we've lamented about this many a nights here. So we found out the virus was here. Utahns were being diagnosed. We did an incredible shutdown and definitely started to flatten the curve. Well, now that we are reopening things eight, 10 weeks later, the virus isn't sitting there thinking, well, Utah did shut down schools and a lot of businesses for this, this long. So I'm just going to not hit them as hard. I mean, right. are we just kind of stretching it out? It, it hasn't gone away. So well, right. Yeah, that's that exactly, that's exactly right. When we talk about flattening the curve, you're literally squishing it. So it's lower and longer. And what that does is it allows our hospitals and our healthcare systems to have capacity to care for everyone over that longer period of time. So yes, that is exactly what we're trying to do is okay. to just make sure that it's this slow burn rather than having a huge peak where our hospitals you know, can't offer a bed to everybody who needs it. And that, that would be tragic. And so right. we're, we're squishing it, we're so making it longer. Everyone getting it, who's going to get it in this amount of time, everyone nope. who's going to get it is going to, in this amount of time. Okay. Absolutely. It's an interesting way of thinking it, but because of course we all value human life so much. So it's like, we're doing this to save lives. And inadvertently we are, I know. at the end of the day, it's I know things. If you're going to get it, you're going to get it almost. Seems it's like. so hard. Yeah. And we were looking at unemployment numbers today, right? And those are yeah. sobering as well. And we know acutely in the health sector that unemployment equals potentially poor health outcomes longer down the road, right? right. So especially we make, yeah. yeah. And so we want to make sure we're setting up Utah to be healthier, not damage it because of one thing. So it is a tricky balance that we're trying to find here. Um, I find it interesting, uh, those folks who invoke constitutional rights and uh, even the idea that this is all a hoax and all of that, um, I, I, I have come to the conclusion just on my own, so take it for what it's worth, that the virus doesn't care about constitutional rights. It doesn't care about boundaries. It doesn't care what's in your bank account. It doesn't care what you do for a living. All the virus cares about is where am I going to get my next host? Where is my next host? That's all it cares about. Am I yeah. off base on this? No, no, you should come work for the Department of Health. Um, we could use some more warm bodies. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, Unfortunately, we are asking people to do really hard things and, and change their lifestyle in order to prevent something that isn't tangible. Um, and that is really, really tough to do. Um, but what we do know is that this virus wreaks havoc on people that have underlying medical conditions or over the age of 65. And, and to your point, we actually know that the host they prefer is somebody who works indoors in close settings with you know, a lot of people shoulder to shoulder, that's where we get COVID-19 spread. So we need to be really mindful as we're opening up the economy that these work sites need help and support to prevent spread within their work sites because that's how you're gonna get in the community, right? 
Dr. Dunn, you are so well-spoken and you explain a complex thing so everyone can understand it. Again, it's been so nice to have you up there kind of leading our state and providing the information. Really, you've done a fantastic job and I know it's not easy and you're a mom and a wife as well and have concerns about your own family, but thank you so much really honestly for, for helping us all get through this. And you also have that sense of like security and comfort that you bring, I think to the podium <laughs> that we are going to do this and we're doing it and to keep it up. So I admire that in you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And of course we want to thank all of our Facebook friends who have been taking part uh, in this town hall Tuesday. We do it every Tuesday. Dr. Dunn, I, I'm going to ask you and put you on the spot right this minute. And that is, we've got to have you back on Town Hall Tuesday because we've got a ton of questions that are going to be left unanswered. No, we can't get through tonight. them all. Yeah, we can't get through them all. But hopefully you'll agree to come back um, uh, in the future so that we can continue to have this discussion. It is extremely important. It is vital. Uh, if you aren't wearing a face mask in public, please wear a face mask in public. Social distance when you go out and make sure that uh, what you are doing will keep you and your loved ones safe. Dr. Dunn, do you have any parting comments for us on this Town Hall Tuesday? You know, the risk of COVID is high right now, but we as Utahns can come together to fight this. We don't need to shut down the economy to do this. And, and let's prove that right by, like you said, wearing a face covering when you're out in the public, social distancing and staying home when you're ill. I, I really, really believe we can do this. So I appreciate the time uh, we spent together this evening. Thanks so much, Dr. Dunn. Yeah, these have become like the new fashion accessory. I need to get a cute fabric one, but absolutely. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> we got it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Who's the much. doctor now? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There's that joke again, Dr. Yeah, Dunn. Yeah, I love it. Keep it up. <laughs> yes. Well, you stay healthy and look forward to, to your daily briefings and hopefully, you know, better news each day. We'll get better and better news on this front. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being on Town Hall Tuesday here on the Fox 13 Facebook page. Uh, we look forward to chatting with you again next Tuesday, same time, same bat channel. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.